We've now got Docker containers to solve issues with running npm run start in development, run test in development, and run build in a production environment as well. So we've now essentially set up everything that we need on the Docker side of this equation. Now we're going to figure out how to use these containers that we put together to really implement this flow that we spoke about earlier, where we're going to have a GitHub repo with some feature branch that you and I are going to develop on, with a master branch that we're going to deploy from, and an integration with Travis CI and AWS as well. Now before we start to implement this process right here with the containers we put together, one quick note. So we're going to be using a couple of different services here, like we just said, GitHub, Travis CI, and AWS. Now GitHub is a completely free service, and if you're here in a course about Docker, I'm going to kind of assume that you understand the basics of Git. Most notably commits, pushing branches, creating branches, all that kind of good stuff. I'm also going to assume that you already have a GitHub account. So if you don't have a GitHub account, or if you have no experience with Git whatsoever, well, you know, do your best to come through with this. I'll be as clear as I can on why we are running some of our different commands when working with Git. But again, I'm going to kind of assume you've got a reasonable understanding of Git. Now, Travis CI is another free service that we're going to be making use of. They are the CI or continuous integration provider. This is the service that's going to be running our tests for us automatically, and then eventually deploying our application over to AWS for us as well. Now, I'm, I'm not going to assume that you have experience with Travis. So if you have not worked with it before, no problem whatsoever. We're going to walk through it step by step together. But again, I kind of hope that you know you got some knowledge of Git and GitHub. Travis CI is a free service, no credit requ card required or anything like that. And the last service that we're going to be making use of is AWS. They're going to be hosting our application once we deploy it. AWS is free to sign up for, but I do believe that they require a credit card if you're going to sign up. Now, if you don't have a credit card to use with AWS, or if for some reason you don't want to create an account, that's okay. You know, for the most part, we're going to be just doing a handful of videos that are going to be focused around AWS. So no big issue if you're not familiar with AWS, or if you don't have an account with them and don't want to make one, I will be running through all the commands and setup that you're going to need to know. So even if you don't want to work with AWS, I still recommend you watch this next series of videos and just kind of get a sense of what's going on. At the end of the day, once you put your application into a Docker container, deployment to all these different providers like AWS or Google Cloud or DigitalOcean, really it's all pretty darn similar. We're just using AWS here because they're one of the you know more popular providers out there for hosting. So with all that in mind, let's take a quick break. In the next section, we're going to start implementing our big development flow here, starting off first with a little bit of GitHub work. So quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute. In this section, we're going to walk through a little bit of initial work with GitHub. We're going to set up first a GitHub repository that's going to house all of our code. We're then going to set up a local Git repository we're going to connect the local Git repository on your computer to the GitHub remote that we're going to set up. And then we're going to take all of our local work and push it up to GitHub. Now, again, just like I said in the last section, I'm going to assume that you've got working knowledge of Git and GitHub here. So if you don't, well, do your best to follow along. Honestly, you do have to do a little bit of additional setup in addition to what I'm going to show you if you've never used Git before. If you're completely lost on Git, I would encourage you to still watch anyways, and you'll probably absorb just a little bit of stuff. So let's get to it. So step one is going to be to create a new GitHub repository. So I'm going to first navigate to GitHub. I'm going to make sure that I'm signed in. And then on the top right hand side, I'm going to click the little plus button and create a new repository. I then get prompted for the name of my repo. I'm going to name this Docker dash react. So feel free to name the repository whatever you want. Just keep in mind that if you use a different name, you're going to have to change a couple of different commands that we're going to run. After you put in the repository name, do be sure to mark the repository as public. A ton of stuff that we're going to do is not going to work the way you expect it to work if you set it up as private. Now on your own personal projects, if you eventually want to use a private repository, that is totally fine. You're still going to be able to use the same flow that I'm going to show you. You're just going to have to add in some credentials at some key steps along the way. But for this first go through, definitely stick with public. After verifying both those settings, I'll click on create repository. And then I get prompted right here with a link to the GitHub repository that was just created. So I'm gonna copy this link 
and then I'm going to go back over to my command line and we're going to set up a Git repository. If you're following along with Git on your own and you kind of want to go through these steps yourselves, we're essentially going to do what it says right here, more or less. All right, so I'm going to flip back over to my terminal and I'm going to make sure that I'm inside of my front end directory. And then inside of here, I'm going to create a new Git repository by running git init like so. I'll then add all the work that we've done so far by writing git add dot, and then I'll commit all that work with git commit dash m, and then a set of double quotes, and inside of there I'll say initial commit, and I'll close the quotes off. Okay, so that's going to commit all of our work. Now we're going to set up the remote and this is what's going to tie this local Git repository that we just created to the GitHub repository that we made a second ago. So I'll write out git remote add origin. So we're essentially adding a remote that is called origin, and then we're going to provide the link to that remote. And the link to that remote is the one that we just copied right here. So I'm going to paste that link in, hit enter, and we're good to go. Now the last thing to do is push all of our work up to that remote. So I'll say git push origin master. Okay, so that's gonna push all of our work up. I should then be able to flip back over to GitHub on my new Docker React repo. I'll hit refresh, and then I'll see all of my work up here here. And so most notably, I really wanna make sure that I've got my Docker file inside of here. All right, so that's pretty much it for GitHub setup. Now we are going to come back to GitHub at a couple of different times to kind of walk through this whole big flow that we're going to go through with pull requests and feature branches and whatnot. But for right now, we're going to start to pivot and focus on a little bit of setting up Travis CI. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we set up a Git repository on GitHub and our local machine, and then we wired the two together. We're now going to start working on our Travis CI integration with GitHub. Now we haven't spoken about Travis CI too much, so let me give you a very brief overview. The entire idea of Travis CI is to watch for any time that you and I push some changes or some amount of code to the GitHub project that we just created. Any time that we push up some new code, GitHub is essentially going to tap on the shoulder of Travis. And it's going to say, hey, this person just updated their GitHub repository. There's some new code here or some new version of their application. Travis CI will then automatically pull down all of the code inside of our GitHub repository. And at that point, it essentially gives us the ability to do some work. Now really the sky is the limit with Travis. We can do anything with your code that you can possibly imagine. We can test your code, we can deploy it. We could even delete the whole GitHub repository from Travis if for some crazy reason you wanted to. Traditionally, people use Travis for either testing their code base or for deployment. And for us, we're gonna use it for both. We're gonna first use Travis to test our code. And then once our code comes up green or once the tests pass successfully, we'll automatically have Travis deploy our application over to AWS. So with that in mind, let's start setting up Travis CI. Fortunately, the setup is really easy and really straightforward. To get started, I'm gonna open up a new browser tab and then I will navigate to travis-ci.org. Now, once here, you'll notice I'm already signed in. I'll go ahead and sign out. You'll probably see a page like this right here. You can click on either sign in with GitHub or sign up right in the middle. So click on either, and then you'll be prompted to authorize Travis CI. Now, this is a page provided by github.com. Of course, GitHub is using, or excuse me, Travis CI is making use of OAuth here. So you are essentially granting access to all of your GitHub repositories over to Travis CI. So I'll scroll down to the bottom and authorize it. Now, once we go through that, we'll get redirected back over to the Travis CI dashboard. As a quick note, if the dashboard looks different from you, that is totally fine. Very quickly, you might be seeing something that looks a little bit like this. Uh, where's my dashboard? There we go. So if you some, see something that looks like this, that is totally fine. Travis CI is going through a little bit of a redesign right now. And so by the time you watch this video, you might already be seeing the new design. And if you are, that's totally fine. Now I'm going to undo that little beta feature. There we go. Okay, so the first thing we have to do here is tell Travis CI that we want it to watch the GitHub repo that you and I just put together. So up on the right-hand side, I'm gonna click on the profile link. 
If you see a green screen or a green box right here that talks about enabling Travis CI as a GitHub app, then you need to go ahead and click that green button. But again, that's kind of a new beta feature that I don't yet have access to, but it's another thing that Travis CI is going to roll out at some point. So if you see a little box right here that says, oh yeah, something, something GitHub app, just go ahead and click on that button. Once you go through that, you'll then be presented with a big list of all the different repositories that exist inside your account. So we're going to filter this list and find the docker-react repository that we just created. Once you find on the list, we'll then click the little, I don't know, switch right there. By clicking that switch, we're essentially telling Travis CI that anytime we push new code up to that GitHub repository, we want Travis CI to pull that code down and do some amount of work on it. So that's pretty much step one. Step one is now complete. We can now click the logo on the top left-hand side and go back to our dashboard, where you will now see a repository listed on the left-hand side. You can click on it and you'll see something like this, something that says no builds for this repository because we have not yet really done anything at all. Let's take a quick pause right here. We're gonna come back to the next section and we'll start talking about how we can customize Travis CI and tell it to do some amount of work for us. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we set up some integration between Travis CI and GitHub. Now, anytime that we push our code up to GitHub, Travis CI is gonna get a little tap on the shoulder and be told, hey, this person just pushed some new code. Download the code and do some amount of work on it. Now the real question is, what is Travis going to do with our code base? Well, Travis is not going to just automatically or magically figure out what to do. We have to be very explicit, very clear with Travis CI and say, here is exactly what we want you to do. We want you to test our code and then if all the tests pass, we want you to deploy our project over to AWS. For right now, we're just gonna focus on getting all everything set up for running our tests. We're not gonna worry about the AWS deployment just yet. So even with running our tests, we have to give Travis a little bit of direction. I mean, we have to tell it how to essentially start up Docker, how to run our test suite, and how to interpret the results. In order to do so, we're gonna create a file called the travis.yaml file and we're going to put that into our root project directory. The travis.yaml file is gonna have the series of directions to tell Travis exactly what we want it to do. Now I put together a little diagram to kind of outline the different steps that we're gonna put into that file. So here's what we need to do inside of the travis.yaml file. First off, we're gonna tell Travis that we need to have a copy of Docker running. Our entire project relies upon Docker. We need the Docker CLI to build an image and to create a container out of that image. And so definitely, as soon as Travis pulls down our entire repository, we need to have a copy of Docker waiting to go, or ready to go, ready for us to run a couple commands to build our image and then run our test suite. So after we tell Docker, or excuse me, after we tell Travis that we need a copy of Docker, we'll then write a little bit of configuration to tell Travis to build our image using the dockerfile.dev file. Now, that might be a little bit surprising, the fact that I'm saying we're going to use dockerfile.dev. Well, quick reminder here, the entire purpose of Travis is to first run our test suite. We put together the Docker file, like that production Docker file, just a moment ago. This one right here is specifically used when we want to create a container that is going to be used in production, running on some server ready for users to come and visit. The image that is created by this Docker file has no dependencies or any code inside of it meant for running our test suite. If we want to run our test suite, we have to use the dockerfile.dev file instead. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to make sure that we build an image using the dockerfile.dev file. After we build the image, we'll then tell Travis how to run our test suite. Essentially, we're gonna say, hey, to run our test suite, execute docker run, our image, npm run test. That's pretty much it. Then at some point in time in the future, we're gonna come back and make sure that we also tell Travis how to deploy our project over to AWS. But again, we're not gonna do that just yet. Just to make sure that's clear, I'll put that in yellow. So for right now, we're just focused on getting our test to run on Travis. So let's get to it. I'm gonna flip back over to my code editor and in my root project directory, I'm gonna make a new file called .travis.yml, like so. Now really important here, please, please, please make sure you get that, that leading dot. It's .travis, 
.yaml. If you don't have that leading dot right there, we're going to run into some issues later on. Okay, so now inside of here, we're going to start writing out some configuration for these three steps. Now the configuration that we're going to put in here, we're going to go over rather quickly, just because this is not quite so much a course about Travis, you know, it's supposed to be about Docker, so I'll give you some brief explanation about each of the steps. The first thing we're going to do is say sudo required. Anytime that we're making use of Docker, we have to have super user permissions. And so sudo required says, hey Travis, we need super user level permissions in order to execute this build. The next thing we're going to do is make sure that Travis CI understands that we need the Docker CLI pre-installed. So we'll say services and then list out Docker like so. By adding this in, Travis CI is going to automatically install a copy of Docker into our little running container. Well, I don't really want to get into what Travis does behind the scenes, but essentially this is going to say, hey, Travis CI, we need a copy of Docker ready to go. After that, we'll define another section called before install. Before install right here is going to have a series of different commands that get executed before our tests are ran. And so you can kind of imagine anything that we list right here as being some series of steps or some series of setup that needs to occur before we start to either deploy our project or before we start to run our tests. And so for you and I, we want to attempt to build our Docker image before the tests run. So I'm going to put in a little dash and then we'll write out the command that should be executed to build our Docker image. So we'll say docker build. We're going to make sure that we force this thing to use the dockerfile.dev file. So I'll say dash f dockerfile.dev and then we'll set the build context by putting a dot in, which remember essentially means use the current directory when figuring out what to do. Now one last quick thing here. Remember anytime that we run docker file or sorry, docker build, we get back the ID of the image that is created. Throughout this course, we've been copy pasting that ID around, but you can kind of imagine that when we start doing this stuff with Travis CI, we don't really get the ability to easily copy paste those IDs around. We're not involved in this process one bit. These are all automated commands that are going to be executed on our behalf. So in order to avoid having to kind of juggle that ID around and copy paste it to the next command, we'll instead just put a tag or a label of sorts on the image that is created. So we can refer to the image that is created by a name rather than a randomly generated ID. So to tag this thing, I'll say dash T, then my Docker username, which is Steven Greider. Again, that's my Docker username. And I'll say dash, and I'll put in the name of the repository that we are building from here, docker-react. So docker-react. So now in the future, we could refer to the image that is created by saying Stephen Greider slash docker slash react or whatever your username is. Now, one thing to be aware of here, we do not have to tag this thing with this really long, very formal tag. We could just as easily say my, oops, we could just as easily say my image or test me or something like that because the tag that is being applied here is only going to be used inside of this essentially Travis process, not gonna be used anywhere else. So you can use any tag you want there, but it is good convention to use the real convention here, which is the Docker username and then the repository name after it. Okay, so this is looking pretty good. Let's take a quick pause right here. When we come back to the next section, we're gonna to start to tell Travis how to run our test suite, and then we'll try doing a test deploy this and make sure that everything works as expected. So I'm gonna save this file, and we'll do a quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we started putting together our Travis.yaml file. Remember, this is the file that's gonna tell Travis what we want it to do with our code. So we've now told it that we have a copy of Docker running, and we've also told it to build an image using the dockerfile.dev file. We now need to add in one last little line of configuration that's going to tell Travis how to run our test suite. So back inside of my .travis.yaml file, I'm going to add in a new section called script. The script section is supposed to contain all the different commands that need to be executed to actually run our test suite. So these are going to be a series of commands, just like before install was, that are going to be ran when our tests need to actually be executed. Travis CI is going to be watching the output of each of these commands. 
And from each command, if it ever gets a return status code other than zero, Travis is going to assume that our build failed or that our test suite failed to run properly. And it's going to assume that our code is essentially broken. So in order to actually run our tests, we're going to use the same Docker command that we used just a little bit ago to start up our container out of that image right there and run the tests inside of it. So quick reminder on how we do that. We're essentially going to say something like Docker run the image, and then we're going to override the default start command by saying npm run test, like so. Now, one little gotcha here, just a tiny little gotcha. Anytime that we run our test suite on Travis CI, Travis is going to assume that our test suite runs and then exits automatically. And he essentially says, okay, I either successfully ran all tests or something wrong just occurred. However, the default behavior of npm run test, well, let's run this right now and you'll see what the default behavior is. So the default behavior is to run our test suite one time and then present us with this menu right here that says, okay, well, you know, I'm just gonna sit here and wait for you to tell me whether you want to do some more tests or filter or do whatever else. So the default npm run test command just kind of hangs there and never exits ever. And so if we ran this on Travis CI, Travis would say, well, you know, it's been like 30 days and I'm still waiting here for the results of npm run test. And they're never gonna come because npm run test just sits and hangs and waits from, for input from you and I. So to work around this and make sure that the test suite automatically exits the instant that the first run is completed, we're gonna add on a little additional command up here. We're gonna say dash 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 coverage, like so. So notice how there's two sets of dashes. So I'm gonna run that. And then we're going to see that the test suite runs and then exits back to the command line. You'll notice that when it runs, it gets a, we get a little bit of output right here. This is essentially telling us how much code inside of our project is being covered by our tests. In reality, it's essentially saying how many lines of code or functions or whatever it might be actually got executed when the tests were executed. Now it's totally fine that we return this stuff to Travis CI. Again, the only thing that Travis cares about is the status code that comes back from running this command. So we're just gonna add on that dash 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 coverage just to make sure that the npm run test command automatically exits when the test suite is done. Okay, so with that in mind, back at script right here, to run our test suite, we're gonna say docker run. Then we'll provide the name of the image that we just built, Steven Greider slash docker dash react. And then we'll override the default command by saying npm run test dash 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 coverage. Again, don't forget the two sets of dashes there with the space in between. All right, and that is pretty much it. That's all we have to do right now. So now anytime that Travis sees that we have pushed a new commit up to GitHub, it's gonna clone all of our code and then use these series of directions to build our Docker image, run some tests, and then report on whether our tests succeeded or failed. So let's save this file. We're gonna take a break right now, and then we'll test out the setup in the next section. In the last section, we finished putting together our Travis.yaml file. We're now ready to commit all the changes we've made and push them up to GitHub. As soon as we push up these changes, Travis should kick into gear and attempt to pull down our code, build the image, test it, and then report back to us. So all we have to do is commit the changes that we made locally, push them up to GitHub, and Travis should essentially take it from there. So I'm gonna flip on over to my terminal and I'm gonna first commit all the changes I just made by running git add dot and then git commit dash m added Travis file inside of the double quotes like so. So that's gonna create a new git, git commit. We can now push that up to GitHub with git push origin master like so. So we'll run that. And as far as we are concerned, that is pretty much it. Now Travis is going to take it from here. So we can flip on over to our browser and open up Travis CI and find the project that you added on the left-hand side. Again, at some point in the future, Travis CI is going to redesign their UI. So you might see something that looks a little bit different than I. Essentially, you just want to find a repository. So now if you do not immediately see the build pop up, that is totally fine. You can try doing a quick refresh and hopefully something like this will appear if everything correctly got wired up. So inside of here, you can see the output from our build. If you scroll down a little bit, you'll see job log 
and you'll get a printout right here of all the different logs that are coming from the build that we're trying to put together. So in a moment or two, oh, there's a good one right there. So it's sudo service docker start. That is Travis adding support for Docker to our build. You'll then see our container being built. So right there, Docker build. We're building the image. There's the NPM install. If you see those NPM warnings, again, totally fine to ignore those, no big deal. And I think we'll, I'm just gonna hold around for just a second. If you don't wanna watch this with me, feel free to pause to the next video, but I'm gonna show you what I see just so you can verify that your build is being done correctly. Again, if you wanna skip this, totally fine. Okay, I was hoping it would go a little bit faster than this. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what, let's take a quick pause. We'll come back to the next section and, oh, wait, oh, I don't know what to do. Okay, post install, yeah, this is good. Okay, we'll just sit because that's pretty much it. That was the one big pause we got. So it's now done with the entire NPM install. So the next thing that's gonna happen is we're gonna do that copy. The copy happened, it was very quick there, and then it went on to the next series of actions, which was to run our test suite. Our one test passed, we printed out the coverage report, and then we got the output here, which is the command exited with zero, which we will recall a status code of zero means everything ran successfully. And so Travis CI is going to interpret this as a successful build. And in fact, if you scroll back up, you should see everything in green like so. If this stuff is not green, you should be able to just refresh the page and it should be green once you come back to it. Okay, so that's pretty much it. We now have a pipeline in place to automatically watch our GitHub repository for changes, pull down our source code, run those tests, and then report back to us and tell us whether or not everything went A-OK. -okay. So this is looking pretty sweet. Let's take a quick pause right here and we'll continue in the next section. In the last section, we were able to successfully run our tests on Travis CI. So now in theory, our application would be ready to be deployed to some outside hosting provider, such as AWS or Windows Azure or DigitalOcean, whatever it might be. Now in our case, we're gonna set up some automatic deployment over to AWS. This is a point at which I'm hoping you've got a AWS account already created. Again, recall that in order to sign up for AWS, you do need to have a credit card. You won't be billed anything, but you do have to enter some credit card details. Now, if you don't have a credit card, that's totally fine. You can always follow along, just you won't go through the AWS part in particular. So let's get to it. The first thing that we're going to do is to log on to AWS and create a new application that is going to be used as the target for our deployment. So I'm going to open up a new browser tab and I'll navigate to aws.amazon.com. And then once here, I'll sign in by going up to my account and opening up the AWS Management Console. I'll then sign in. And then I get redirected to the AWS dashboard. And at this point, I'm going to scroll in a pretty good amount just so you can see everything A-OK. -okay. Now to deploy our project, we're going to be making use of Elastic Beanstalk which you can find by searching for Elastic Beanstalk like so. Elastic Beanstalk, I'm gonna tell you right now, by far easiest way to get started with production Docker instances. Now to be clear, Elastic Beanstalk is most appropriate when you're running exactly one container at a time. We can start up multiple copies of the same container, but at the end of the day, easiest way to run one single container. I'm gonna click on this search result and then we get prompted with the EBS or the Elastic Beanstalk dashboard. Now you'll notice that I've already got an application on here. We can just totally ignore that. That's just a tiny little personal project that I'm working on for right now. On the top right hand side, I'm gonna find the link to create a new application and I'll click on it. We then get prompted for an application name. Now you can use Docker React. Unfortunately, if I use Docker React, I already have a project called Docker React, so I'm not gonna use that. I'm just gonna call this simply Docker. You can call it Docker, Docker React, whatever you want it to be. And then we'll click on Create. Now when we create the application, that just kind of creates a workspace of sorts. To actually have some target that we can deploy to, we have to create something called an environment. And as you can see right here, we are being prompted to create one right away. So we'll click on the Create One Now link. And then we get prompted for a couple of different inputs here you'll see that we are being asked if we are making a web server or worker environment. In our case, we are going to be creating a website, so we're going to leave web server environment selected. I'll then click select on the bottom right. We then get prompted with a couple other questions here. The only thing that we have to enter in 
is if you scroll down, you'll find base configuration. Under platform, we're going to select Docker. We'll then scroll down. We can leave sample app application selected for right now. That's totally fine. And then we'll click on create environment. So this is going to set up a bunch of infrastructure on your AWS account. Don't worry, it can all be closed down very, very easily with just one or two clicks. And we're definitely gonna go through that process at the end of all this deployment stuff. That's actually something worth talking about for just a little bit. If you leave all these instances up that we're going to create, you will eventually be billed some amount of money for them. Now, the good news is that if you leave them running, it's gonna be a rather small amount of money, particularly if your AWS account is still under the free tier provision. However, again, I don't want you to be billed for anything. So remember, if you drop out of this section halfway through, please do skip towards the end where we'll walk through the process of shutting down this application so that you will not be billed. Okay, so as you can see, this is gonna go through a little bit of setup for us. We're gonna let this just do its thing for right now because it is gonna take a good number of minutes. So let's take a quick break and we'll rejoin in just a moment. In the last section, we set up a new Elastic Beanstalk instance. As soon as the initial setup is complete, you're going to see something like this on the screen. Now, before we move on, I want to very quickly tell you a little bit more about Elastic Beanstalk and give you a better idea of why we're using it. All right, so here's what's happening right now with Elastic Beanstalk. One of our users, in reality, you and me, as we're testing the application, is going to open up their web browser and attempt to navigate to our application running on AWS. When they attempt to navigate to our website, their request will be handled by a load balancer that has already been created as a part of the Elastic Beanstalk application that we just created in the last section. So this load balancer has already been created for us. When a request comes into it, the load balancer will route that request to a virtual machine that is running Docker. And on that virtual machine, our Docker container will be running with our application inside of it. The benefit to Elastic Beanstalk is that it monitors the amount of traffic that's coming in to our virtual machine right here. And as soon as that traffic reaches a certain threshold, Elastic Beanstalk is going to automatically add in additional virtual machines to handle that traffic. So as soon as a request comes in, it's gonna to go to the load balancer. The load balancer is gonna find the node here with the least amount of traffic, and it will route that request to that particular virtual machine. Our application, running inside of the Docker container will then respond to that request and the user will eventually get the file that they were looking for. So that's pretty much it. The benefit to Elastic Beanstalk is that it's going to automatically scale everything up for us. All right, so now that we've got a better idea of how Elastic Beanstalk is doing things for us, I wanna flip back over to the EBS dashboard. Here it is right here. So as you can see on the very top line, we have a URL. This is the address of our application as it stands right now. You can open up this link in a new tab and you'll see a welcome message like this right here. So this is the default application that is launched anytime that you make a new Elastic Beanstalk instance running Docker. So of course, we're going to eventually want to replace all this stuff with our application. All right, so let's take another quick break. In the next section, we're going to make use of this new EBS instance and wire it up to our Travis CI deployment process. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. Now that our Elastic Beanstalk instance has been created, we're gonna to start to configure Travis CI to automatically deploy our application over to AWS once our tests have successfully passed. So to do so, we're gonna add some more configuration to the travis.yaml file that we had created inside of our root project directory. I'm gonna open up my code editor, and then inside of here, I'm gonna find the travis.yaml file. You'll recall that we currently have the before install and script sections inside of here. And both those are concerned solely with putting together our initial image and then running some tests using that image. I'm gonna add in another section towards the bottom of this file called, as you might guess, deploy. So inside this section, we're gonna add in a bunch of configuration to tell Travis CI exactly how to take our application and deploy it off to AWS. Now, some of these settings that we're gonna put in here are gonna be a little bit laborious, so I really gotta ask you to watch really closely and make sure that you follow along as closely as possible. Now, the first option we're gonna add in here is gonna be really easy and straightforward. We're gonna say provider is Elastic Beanstalk, all one word like so. 
Travis CI comes pre-configured to deploy our application to a handful of different providers or hosting providers, such as AWS or DigitalOcean or whichever other you can possibly imagine. And so by just saying provider Elastic Beanstalk, we're essentially telling Travis CI that, hey, we want you to use this set of instructions to attempt to automatically deploy our application. So by just specifying that right there, Travis CI is gonna really do a lot of stuff for us automatically. Now we're gonna still provide a lot of other options in here as well to just provide some further customization. The next one we're going to provide is region. Now region is gonna be a little bit of a tough one because the region that you're gonna specify depends upon exactly where you originally created your Elastic Beanstalk instance. Let me tell you what I mean by that. If you flip back over to your Elastic Beanstalk dashboard, which should look like this, I want you to look very closely at that URL again. I'm gonna copy the URL and I'm gonna put it over into my code editor just so you can read mine very easily. So when you created your Elastic Beanstalk instance, you created it in a particular region. And when I say region, I'm talking about like area of the earth or kind of continent essentially. So me personally, I created the region in the, excuse me, the Elastic Beanstalk instance in the region US West 2. So right here, you need to specify whatever region your Elastic Beanstalk instance was just created in. You might have something like US East 1, US West 1. You might have a totally different country inside of here. It's gonna be up to you to find whichever code it is. And you're gonna take that code and put it in as the region wrapped inside of quotes. So I'll say US dash West dash 2. And again, what you put in here is going to be whatever you see right there before the elasticbeanstalk.com. All right, so once we got that in there, we're then gonna add in a couple other options. We're gonna specify the name of our app. Now the name of the app is the same name that you had created back over here on the Elastic Beanstalk dashboard. So you see how we have all applications right here? The first word right after that is the name of your app. So I called mine Docker. You might've called yours something like Docker-React. Whatever you have right there, you're gonna take it letter for letter and you're gonna enter it in as the app right here. And so for me, I'm gonna put in simply Docker, like so. The next configuration piece we're gonna add in is the environment name. So when we created the application of Docker or Docker React, that's kind of just setting up a common set of configuration. The actual app that's running inside of here, it's not really referred to as an app, but instead is referred to as an environment. And so the environment is gonna be the last piece on there. For me, my environment name is docker-env. So you're gonna take whatever is listed right there, you're gonna copy it, and then we're gonna put it right in there for env. All right, so that's looking pretty good. Now the next piece of configuration here is gonna be just a little bit nastier than the two we just went through. We're gonna put in a bucket name. So when Travis decides to deploy your code base, it's gonna take all of the files inside of your GitHub repository, it's gonna zip them all up into one single file, and then it's going to copy all of them over to an, excuse me, an S3 bucket, which is essentially a hard drive running on AWS. Once it copies all those files over, Travis CI is then going to essentially poke at Elastic Beanstalk and say, hey, I just uploaded this new zip file. Use that to redeploy your application. So we need to provide the name of the bucket that Travis CI is going to put our zip file into. Now that might sound like it's a little complicated. The good news here is that this has been a S3 bucket that is already automatically generated for you when you initially created the Elastic Beanstalk instance. All we have to do is get the name of it. So to get the name, we're gonna go up to services up here, and then we're gonna do a search for S3. And then you should see S3, scalable storage in the cloud. Then on here, you're gonna look up and down this list. You'll notice that I have a tremendous number, but hopefully you'll have a little, little bit fewer than what I have. You're looking for something like this right here. You should see one called Elastic Beanstalk, dash, and then the name of the region that your bucket, or excuse me, that your Elastic Beanstalk was placed in. So like I just said, mine is US West 2. So I'm going to be looking for something like Elastic Beanstalk dash US West 2. And mine is right there. So I'm going to click on that thing. And then I'll see the name of the bucket 
right up here. And it might be a little bit, I'm having a tough time selecting myself. There we go. If I just right click it, I get the full selection and I can copy it. So I'll take that back over. And for the bucket name, I'm gonna paste it in like so. And then we're going to also do the bucket path. So this bucket right here, or this S3 bucket that's holding all these different files, it gets reused for all other different Elastic Beanstalk environments that you create. So as you can see, I've got a couple of different environments that have been created over time. And so inside of here, I'm going to be looking for the folder that is essentially the name of my project. Now, when you first create your Elastic Beanstalk instance, chances are it's not going to create a folder by default automatically. That folder is only going to be created the first time that you do a deploy. So by default, the bucket path that you're supposed to use is going to be exactly equal to the app name. So you see I have app right here. I'm gonna use the exact name for my bucket path. So for me, I have Docker as my app name, and I'm going to copy that right down to bucket path. Again, you might have used something like Docker React, so make sure if you have the different app name, make sure you use it in there as well. All right, so now last thing we're gonna do in here for right now, remember back to the entire deployment flow that we spoke about a while ago. We had said that we wanted to make sure that any time we deploy, or excuse me, we push our code up to a feature branch on the GitHub repository, we had said that we're going to make a pull request to merge into master. And we had said that the master branch was essentially going to be our very special branch. Anytime we merge code into master, that means it is time to deploy our application. If we just merge code or push code up to the feature branch, we don't want to deploy the app. We don't want to deploy the app using just the feature branch. The feature branch is for active development, and it might have new features that are not ready to be deployed. So the last piece of configuration that we're going to put in there for right now, we're going to say only attempt to deploy the application when the master branch gets some new code. So as the very last thing that I'll do for right now, I'll say on branch master, like so. And so as you might guess, this essentially means anytime we push code to branch master, that's the time to deploy. All right, so I think that's good for right now. Now there's gonna be two other tiny pieces of configuration that we have to add in, but those are gonna take just a little bit of time. So let's take a quick pause right here and continue in the next section and handle those two last pieces. In the last section, we added in a tremendous amount of configuration to our Travis.yaml file. Now the last thing we have to add in here is a set of API keys that are going to give access to our AWS account over to Travis CI. So the last thing we have to do is generate that set of API keys and then enter them into this Travis.yaml script. So let's get to it. I'm going to first get started by opening up my AWS console again. I'll then find the services tab at the top and I'm going to search for IAM. IAM is a service that is used to manage API keys that can be used by outside services. On the left-hand side, let me zoom in here, we're gonna find the section of users because we're essentially gonna get generate a new user that is going to be used by Travis CI. Then at the top, I'll find add user, and then I'll provide a user name. So I'll give this a descriptive name. How about something like Docker React Travis CI? And then underneath that, I'm going to give programmatic access only. The set of API keys that we're gonna generate here are only going to be used by Travis CI through network requests. Travis CI is never going to be making direct use of the AWS Management Console. We'll then hit next for permissions. And then we're going to attach existing policies directly. So we don't have any other policy groups or any other existing users. We're gonna add some direct policies. Now these policies right here are essentially permissions. We are granting permissions to this new user that we are creating. So right now we're essentially listing out all the different things that this new user is going to have the ability to do. In particular, we wanna make sure that this new user has the ability to deploy our application to Elastic Beanstalk. So I'm going to search for Beanstalk, and then I'll see a bunch of different policies that have been pre-generated by AWS up here. here. You can look at the description of each. By far the easiest one to use is provides full access right here. So I'm going to make sure that I find provides full access and I'll go all the way over to the left-hand side and click on that checkbox. And then I'll click on next review and then I'll create user. 
So that generates a set of API keys that can be used by Travis CI to deploy our application. Now this is really important. The secret access key that has been generated is only going to be shown to you exactly one time. So when you click on show right here, and it shows you that API key, you need to make sure that you write this thing down because if you want to get access to this key again, well, you can't. You would have to regenerate the key entirely. So we're going to now use the access key ID and the secret access key. Now, one quick thing, we do not want to take those keys directly, our keys, and put them directly into our travis.yaml file. Remember, right now, our GitHub repository is entirely public. So if we put those GitHub, or excuse me, those AWS keys into our repo and then push that up to GitHub, everyone in the world is going to have access to our AWS account. And so above all, we're going to make sure that we do not put those keys directly in here. Instead, we're going to make use of a feature of environment secrets provided by Travis CI. So I'm going to go back over to my Travis dashboard. Remember, you can get here at travis-ci.org. And I'm going to pull up my project. So again, I called mine Docker React. Then on the right-hand side, I'll find the More Options, and I'll go to Settings. We can then scroll down a little bit and find Environment Variables right here. So these, this right here is where we are going to stash those secret keys. These environment variables are going to be encrypted and stored by Travis CI. So we don't have to worry about outside people getting access to those keys and kind of making use of them in a bad way. With each key, we provide a name and a value for that key. So the first key that we're going to define as an environment variable is our access key. So I'm going to copy the access key then I'll provide a name over here of AWS access key, and I'll paste the value in like so. And notice how we're going to make sure that display value and build log is not checked because we do not want to display this value in the log. I'll then click on add. And as you can see, it essentially gets tucked away and I can no longer really get access to it. All right, now we're going to do the secret as well. So I'll copy the secret. Make sure you get the entire secret. I'll go back over and I'll define a second key. I'll call this one AWS secret key. And I'll paste in the value for that as well. And then I'll hit add. All right, so we've now got our two access keys, or both the access key and the secret key, successfully encrypted on Travis CI. We'll now go back over to our Travis.yaml file. And inside of here, we're going to say, hey, I have an access key for you, but you're going to get it from the local environment configuration. So I'll say access key ID is going to come from the environment variable of dollar sign AWS access key. And for secret access key, we'll say secure AWS secret key. And I personally actually had to wrap this in double quotes like so. So you might want to do that as well. According to the documentation, I don't think you have to, but I found that you had to. Okay, so that's pretty much it. So now after Travis CI attempts to build our project and run our tests, it will then attempt to deploy our application over to Elastic Beanstalk. So as the very last thing, we're going to commit all the work that we have now done, and we're going to push it up to the master branch on GitHub. Again, we're going to eventually use this kind of nice feature branch flow, but for right now, we just want to make sure things are working, so we're going to push directly to master. So I'm going to go back over to my terminal. I'll do a git status and just double check to make sure, yep, I changed that file. I'll do a git add, a git commit, and I'll say something like added Travis deploy config, and then I'll do a git push origin master. All right, so now again, if I flip back over to Travis CI and go back to my dashboard for my project, in just a moment or two, I'll see something up here right here that says, okay, we're running a new build. And just like before, you might have to refresh the page to get that to actually pop up. So I'll do so now. And it looks like it's not quite coming in just yet, but it should just any moment. So let's take a quick break right here. I'll let the build finish up and then we'll continue in the next section. In the last section, we pushed off our project to Travis CI, or more precisely GitHub. Travis CI picked up the project and started building it. 
So my project finished building, all the tests ran successfully, and you can see down here it says preparing deploy, and then deploying application, and then eventually done. If you now very quickly go over to your Docker dashboard and refresh the page, really important, make sure you do the refresh because it won't always kick in the updates here automatically, you might see these spinners that say, oh hey, we're doing a deploy for you. So the reason that I'm showing you this kind of spinner right here before the deploy actually finishes up is that when this finishes, there's actually going to be a little bit of an issue. We're going to see that after the deploy completes successfully, if we try navigating to our URL, the page is just not going to load up. So let me tell you about what's going on. If you recall, every time that we've ran a web server inside of a Docker container, we've had to do something like Docker run dash P and then we did that port mapping and then specified the container or whatever it might have been. So the port mapping right there is done because by default, no port inside of the container gets exposed to the outside world. We have to very directly set up that port mapping ourselves. Now you might notice that everything that we just did with Elastic Beanstalk at no point in time did any of this port mapping occur. So it was a step that we just kind of completely neglected to take care of. The reason that we didn't take care of it right away is that if you went through all the documentation on Elastic Beanstalk around Docker, well, they're going to be, they're not going to quite throw this little tip out there at you. You know, they're not going to really say, oh yeah, you need to expose the port. Because when we expose a port on Elastic Beanstalk, the process is just a little bit different than the command line that we've been doing so far. So to expose a port with Elastic Beanstalk, here's what we do. We're going to find our Docker file that is used for production deployments. And then inside of here, right after the from nginx, we're going to say expose 80, like so. The expose instruction is something that we have not used before. In a development environment, and actually in most environments, the expose instruction is really supposed to be communication to you and I as developers. This is really something for you and I to read inside of a Docker file and understand, oh, this container probably needs to get a port mapped to port 80. So by default on our machines, like your laptop and my laptop, just putting in this instruction does absolutely nothing for us automatically. Now, AWS Elastic Beanstalk is just a little bit different. Elastic Beanstalk, when it starts up your Docker container, it's going to look at this Docker file and it's going to look for the expose instruction. And then whatever port you list in there is what Elastic Beanstalk is going to map directly automatically. So again, for you and me, just putting expose in here does automatically nothing. Elastic Beanstalk is different in that regard. It's going to look at this expose instruction and use that as the port that gets mapped for incoming traffic. So I'm going to save this. And again, I wanted you to see this ahead of time because I didn't want you to like, uh, and as a matter of fact, you'll see right here, it says degraded. Chances are it'll say something like, sorry, but I wasn't able to actually start up or anything like that. Probably somewhere in there. Well, somewhere in there, it'll be there, but you get the idea. It definitely is not working quite the way we expect right now. So we're going to make that change. I got the expose 80 there. I'm going to save the file. We're going to do another git commit, another push up to master and let everything deploy again. So back in my terminal, I'll do a git add, I'll do a git commit, I'll say added expose 80, and I'll do a git push origin master. And we're going to let this thing redeploy itself all over again. So another quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we made a quick change to our Docker file and then redeployed the application. After flowing through Travis CI, we then got our new Docker deployment on Amazon Elastic Beanstalk. You can see that I've now got a health of OK right here. And if I click on the URL at the top, I'll see the React application appear. Awesome, so that's pretty much it. That is our deployed application using Docker. Now the very last thing I wanna show you is the full flow of how you would work on this project if you had a team of other engineers. If you had other engineers working on this project, you would probably push your changes up to a feature branch. It doesn't have to be called feature. It could be any other name of a branch besides master. You would then push that up to GitHub, create a pull request to merge it into master. And then once you merge that pull request, we would then take that code and deploy it off to AWS. So I want to very quickly walk through that flow. We're going to, in this section, make a quick change to our code base. We're going to commit that on a feature branch. We'll push it up to GitHub. We'll make the pull request, and then we'll merge that thing into master. So let's get to it.
The first thing I'm going to do is to check out a new branch on git from my command line. To do so, I'll run git checkout dash b, dash b is what's going to create the new branch, and then we'll call this new branch feature. So I'm now on a new branch. Now we can go and make our little change to our code base. So I'm going to flip back over to my code editor. Inside of my src directory, I'll find the index.js file, or excuse me, app.js, there it is. And then inside of here, again, inside of this paragraph tag, I'll change that to just be anything else. How about something like, I was changed on the feature branch. And then I'll save that file. We'll now go back over to our terminal. I will add that change. I'll commit the change. I'll say something like change app text. And then we're going to push this up to GitHub specifically to the feature branch. So I'll say git push origin feature, like so. So this creates a new branch up on GitHub called feature. And now to merge it into master and get those changes deployed, we need to go create a pull request and then merge the pull request. To do so, I'll open up my browser again, and I'm going to go to my GitHub repository. I had called that Docker React. You may have called it something different. Basically, just go find the repository. I'll then refresh this page. And once I do so, you'll hopefully see a little pop-up or a little notification right here that says this branch was pulled just about a minute ago. So on the right-hand side of that notification, we can click on compare and pull request. And then we get our open pull request form right here. You can see up here at the top, it's saying that we're going to take everything inside the feature branch and attempt to merge it into the master branch. And so if I was working with other engineers, I would describe some of the changes that I made inside of here. So I would say something like, in this change set, I updated the text of app.js. We could then mention other engineers to come and review our code or whatever you might wanna do for your particular team. We'll then click on create pull request and then other engineers can come to this thing, leave comments, review the code, and whatnot. Perhaps most interesting, you'll notice that on here, we've got some pending checks. These pending checks are Travis CI booting up. Travis CI sees that we have issued a change or issued this pull request, and it's going to pull down all of our changes, run tests on them, and then report back here and say, hey, here's what happened. Let's take a quick pause right here and let these tests run. And then when we come back, we'll attempt to merge this pull request and make sure that the deployment starts up. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we created a new pull request to merge code from our feature branch into the master branch. As soon as we created that pull request, Travis CI kicked into gear and ran some tests over our code base. You'll notice that there were actually two sets of checks that were issued. The first check was the fact that we just pushed some code up to, up to GitHub. The second check, kind of faked merging our code into the master branch and then running the tests. So one test or one set of tests right here was to say, hey, the code that was pushed by itself is valid and the code that was pushed merged to master is valid as well. So now that both of our checks have succeeded, we can now merge the pull request. As soon as we merge this pull request, Travis CI is going to kick in to gear again. It's going to run our tests a third time, and then after it, because it is a change that was issued to the master branch, it's going to automatically attempt to deploy our application again over to Elastic Beanstalk. So in theory, someone might say like, your code looks good. So maybe that's some other engineer. I would see that, I'd say, okay, cool, time to merge. So I'd merge the pull request, confirm the merge, that merges the code, we now have all of our changes safely merged into the master branch. So now we can go back over to Travis CI. After a second or two, we'll see a new build appear over here. I'll try refreshing just to get it to pop up a second sooner. Come on, come on, any second now. Well, I'm not gonna make you wait too long, but eventually the build is gonna kick off because we made a change to the master branch. And then because it's a change to master, Travis is going to deploy back over to Elastic Beanstalk afterwards. So we'll take another quick break right here. I'm gonna let the build run again, and I'm gonna let the deploy run again as well. Oh, and there's the build right there. So I'll let both the build run and the redeploy run, and then we'll join back up in the next section and just verify that everything got deployed successfully. So quick break, and I'll see you in another minute. In the last section, we ran through the entire flow of making a change to our application and then redeploying it. 
we merged the pull request on GitHub. That triggered a change on Travis CI, which redeployed our application, and that automatically updated Elastic Beanstalk. So now if I go back to my URL right here, I'll see I was changed on the feature branch. And that's pretty much it. So that's a pretty rock solid development workflow that you can use in your own team of engineers or even by yourself if you want to have your own kind of personal review process. Now, one quick thing I want to mention here, and this is a diagram that we had looked at a while ago, we did not really have to use Docker for any of the stuff that we just went through. The entire process of hooking up Travis CI, of running our tests, of deploying with Elastic Beanstalk, Docker was just not required. And we could have done all this by making use of shell scripts and whatnot, and we could have just completely ignored Docker. The difference here and the reason that we used Docker was that it significantly made setting up all this stuff a lot easier. If you really think about it, once we got our Docker file put together, so this right here, once we got that put together, the only kind of piece of complexity that there was during the development process, I mean deployment process, was the Travis.yaml file. And the vast majority of all this stuff was just understanding that, hey, we need to first build the image and then execute this command right here to run the tests. That was pretty much it. Just about everything that we just could put together could be reused with any other type of valid Docker container. So we could probably sub in a Rails application with all the same infrastructure. And the only difference would be probably how we run the tests right here. That would basically be it. So that's the benefit to using Docker. You set up this pipeline one time, and then you can make small changes over time, but you probably don't have to re-architect your entire deployment pipeline if you decide to change some of your infrastructure or your actual project composition at some point in the future. So I hope this is pretty enjoyable, but we're not quite done yet. So let's take a quick break right here and continue in the next section.